Clear prop. Star 73, Cherokee number two, following twin traffic, three mile final. There's up to one trial at Bravo, Rakesford in runway 25, going uh, four mile final. This is Behind the Prop with United Flight Systems owner and licensed pilot Bobby Doss and his co host, major airline captain and designated pilot examiner Wally Mulhern. Now let's go Behind the Prop. What's up, Wally? Hey, Bobby. How are you? I'm great. We have a guest again this week. Uh, welcome back to the show once more, Mr. Pat Brown. How are you today, Pat? I'm doing great, thanks. This is probably the fourth or fifth time. I know, I've I lost have. count. I appreciate you coming back so many times. <laughs> it's like a bad penny, man. Yeah. You just keep turning up. <laughs> and what uh, we haven't talked about yet today was Pat made a post on the Facebook recently that uh-huh. you got your Master Pilot Award. 52 years of aviating. It took them a couple of years for you to get the certificate. Congratulations yeah, on that. Thanks. That's what happens when you hang around long enough. <laughs> I'm not even 50 yet. It's so like my mind is blown. <laughs> oh, thanks that. a lot for that. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry about that. <laughs> Wally, how long have you been flying now? Well, uh, August, getting... August 31st will be the anniversary of my, actually, my, my 40th um that's when I took my first flying lesson, my first real flying lesson. I actually started in 1967 with my father. I was four years old, um, but that doesn't really count. But 19, August 31st, 1981 is when I actually hopped in an airplane and sat in the left seat and, and said, okay, I'm going to do this for a living. And do you, I don't know how this, what was the, what's the D-mark for that? Is that like first lesson? Is that student pilot certificate? First what? medical. Okay. First medical. Interesting. I'll never get there. I'll just be honest. I'm never going to get to 50 uh, You know, years. you never know. Yeah. You never I don't know. think I'm going to make... I never thought I, I would. I don't think I'm going to make 90-something <laughs> years old. So, But congratulations. It's cool to see that certificate. And that, that's a pin, I guess, that was posted They give as well. you a pin, and they they give you a copy of every piece of paper that the FAA has in your file. Really? Uh, and fortunate, fortunately, mine is only maybe, you know, a half an inch thick. I wouldn't want any thicker than that. Um, yeah, they give you a copy of every everything that they've got in their file there's a nice certificate that recognizes it with a picture of orville and wilbur on there yeah. and and uh um secretary dixon signed it wow. um so it's uh it's i'll tell you it's a little bit mind-boggling i never you know when i was i'm not going to tell you quite how old i am but back when i was that age you know taking my first lesson um i i never envisioned Wow, fifty years, fifty-two years now. I never envisioned. I never envisioned any of this stuff. I never started. My entire life has been a happy accident. You know, right. I've never had a plan. <laughs> yeah, I didn't think I'd be sitting here a few years ago either. Yeah. Uh, but I'm happy doing it every day. So I'm that's, that's, that's really that's really counts. cool. That's what counts. Well, w- when you get that, when you get that award, obviously you've you've been flying a long, long, long time. Yeah. Um, and today we're going to take all those fifty plus years of experience between Pat almost 40 with Wally and now I've got I'm almost up to five years there you go six years I guess I've been training for six years so that puts us at 98 years experience here (laughs) one more year we're gonna have over 100 between the three of us um so we're gonna take all those years and we're gonna talk traffic pattern etiquette today in a non-towered field at a non-tower field so um lots of us specifically this airport have a have a whole lot of help with the tower controllers and um, big city like this, we've got a number of towered airports. Um, but today's all about traffic pattern etiquette at non towered airports. So you asked, you brought this up, Pat, tell us like, where's the, where's the, the stick been lately? Where's the thought process been around traffic pattern etiquette? Well, one of the things that I think really kind of sparked my interest in this was when I was doing, um, Flight instructor refresher clinics, you know, the, the weekend deals where flight sure. instructors come to refresh to renew their certificates, and I was teaching the course. And one of the statistics that we kept coming up with when we got into uh, one of the modules that was talking about safety and the safety culture at flight schools was the fact that the majority of mid-air collisions occur within five miles of a non-towered airport on a clear day. Yeah, <clears throat> and so. If you extrapolate that a little bit, a lot of those also will happen in the traffic pattern. 
And some of that is just because of just, just, just poor execution of the traffic pattern itself, maybe not understanding how the traffic pattern is supposed to work. It's a non-towered field. Jason Shepard at MZ, M0A calls it a pilot-controlled environment. I'm not sure I like that term, but he's not, he's not wrong. Sure. So it's up to us as, as individual pilots to control what we do at a non-tower field because obviously there's, there's no tower watching over us telling us what to do. And, and, and I teach out of a non-tower field. I, I, I do examinations out of a non-tower field. Wally does the same thing. He's out of Cleveland. There's no tower there. So it's out of self-preservation as much as anything. I think that this has become yeah, yeah. of interest for me. So, um, I would think all of us have flown to a non-towered field at some point or another. And, and you talk about um, the, the people in the pattern. The, I think the, the big time that I'm thinking about the non tower field is the entry and the departure, right? There's a lot of right. mistakes and errors that I hear people make. Uh, we'll get to radio communication in a second. But uh, what do you think some of the common errors are with people entering? And then we'll talk about departing. What, let's focus on entering the pattern first. What with some pet peeves or heartburn that you see on a regular basis out there, uh, both of you, Wally and Pat. You want to go first, Wally? You you take it, Pat. Right. You're you're leading this. Put you on, put you on the spot there. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah. There's a big smile Wally on will your go face second. right now. Wally will go second. <laughs> well, I gave you a minute to think about it, right? Right. Well, well, first of all, let's talk a little bit about what the literature says. So, if you look at AIM, uh, chapter four specifically. Um, and four dash three dash three, if you really want to get into the weeds, really only gives you one recommendation on a traffic pattern entry, and that's the forty-five degree to the downwind leg, the one that we all learn. But um, and it, but it doesn't say anything about what happens if you're coming in on the other side of the field. For that, you've got to look at the airplane flying handbook, and that's chapter seven. And that recommends a couple of different ways. It recommends, uh, the first recommendation is to cross over the airport at 500 feet above the highest traffic pattern, altitude, fly outbound two miles from the downwind leg, not from the, not from the runway, but from the downwind leg, and then make your descending turn back into the traffic pattern. And real quick, because th- I think I, I still, I, I, I pin myself to private pilots because I don't fly every day like everybody else a private pilot when i was a private pilot i always thought the highest traffic pattern altitude was a thousand feet above the the airport elevation what is the highest traffic pattern altitude at an airport is it always a thousand feet well it's a thousand it's generally you know there are some exceptions and usually you'll find that in in the chart supplement but 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 it's generally a thousand feet agl to twins and turbines typically fly 1500 feet agl so if you're talking about crossing the airport traffic area and pattern at 500 feet above the highest traffic pattern you're talking about 500 feet above 1500 feet right. agl which makes it 2000 feet agl this and could that, be a big deal if a, if a cessna thinks that they're supposed to fly 1500 feet and that lo and behold there's a twin in the pattern yeah right? or a pilatus or, or king yeah. air or something like right. that or a citation and that happens at west houston quite frequently we have a lot of that kind of corporate traffic coming into west houston and um, and and so somebody will be entering the traffic pattern on this 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 what they call the teardrop entry to the downwind leg, uh, crossing the airport at sixteen hundred feet indicated, and think that they're doing what they're supposed to do, and they're not. Of course, one thing that that makes that a little bit of a challenge at some airports is you may have some sort of controlled airspace above that. Sure. If we go too far east out of West Houston Airport, we're going to hit the surface area of uh, of Class Bravo airspace. So now you have to. All right. Well, now there's some common sense that's going to have to be in, involved in all of this. But but um, but back to the kind of the the, the textbook uh, thing is 500 feet above the highest traffic pattern altitude, which is 2,000 feet. So now the book says go two miles past the downwind leg. Well, how far away from the runway is the downwind leg? And that really depends on the type of airplane that you're flying. You're flying a J3, it's probably a quarter mile. If you're flying a I don't know, a Cirrus, it might be a little bit further, a Comanche or some faster airplane, it might be a little bit further out. So, you know, I, so I have students that are asking for guidance and even even applicants after the check ride is over asking for guidance. And so I kind of look at it like this. It says go two miles past the downwind leg. So let's assume the downwind leg is at least a mile out. 
So let's measure now from the center line of the runway. Let's go at least three miles away from the airport, maybe four, depending on how busy the airport is. Then you make your descending turn back in and announce that you're X miles, uh, in the case of West Houston, east of the airport. We're entering a, a 45 degree to the downwind leg. Um, the other way that, that Chapter 7 of, of the Airplane Flying Handbook recommends is just enter midfield at traffic pattern altitude and then turn downwind at the midfield point, giving way to any traffic that might be entering the, the pattern at the uh, at the 45. Um, you know, and that's okay. I, I, I guess the only peeve I have with that one is that depending on the kind of airplane that you're flying and and when you start slowing down, you may have a hard time as you turn midfield. You don't have very much time before you beam the, uh, the, the the approach into the runway. And are you configured? Are your flaps in? Is your gear down? Again, it, there's a lot of fast there's the a lot of things that go into this. It's 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 you can look at the textbook and what the textbook says, but at some time, at some point, there, there you have to apply some common sense and some airmanship. To all of this, if that sure. makes any sense at all. And my, what, what really got my attention on this teardrop entry thing, I was telling you before we turned on the microphones, was several years ago, in fact, twice in the last several years, I've almost been involved in midair collisions where somebody is doing an improper teardrop entry to the downwind leg and it's almost you know, gotten us entering properly because if you don't go far enough out and you start that, that teardrop turn back into the airport, you're either going to be conflicting with the downwind traffic and I'm talking about head on yeah. or depending on where you start the turn or how shallow or steep the turn is, you're going to be conflicting with the, with the crosswind traffic. And either one of those are just fatalities waiting to happen. And unfortunately there's a lot of history with that kind of stuff happening. Yeah. And I think, I think a lot of technology and we're at non-controlled airports, but we probably all have an iPad and we are assuming that everybody's got ADSB now and they're on that little screen. But, but at a non-controlled airport, 50 miles outside of town, they might not have ADSB. There could be a plane out there working that pattern without a radio and without yeah. ADSB. Yeah. And I think we, we might get too dependent on that little triangle of, of traffic and, uh, that's not always going to be a reality at a non-controlled yeah, field. For you're sure. absolutely right. Yeah. Wally, what are your thoughts? Well, as we sit right here, we, we've already talked about a couple of different uh, ways to enter a traffic pattern. And, and the other caveat is that these are recommended, mm -hmm. recommended, that they're not required. So, I mean, when I go to a restaurant and the waiter recommends the fish, um, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not ordering the fish. Okay. I'll take the check chicken. I don't care what you recommend. Um, so, you know, it is recommended and hopefully everybody, uh, is, is following the recommendations of, of, of these traffic pattern entries, but there is some room for interpretation. There is some wiggle room. Uh, this is not required. Well, we've all probably seen someone flying left traffic in an airport that has a big R on the map, right? I mean, yeah. again, recommended. It's on the chart. Do we look at the chart? Do we know what it says? There's there's recommended and best practices and all that go out the window if you look down at the other end of the airfield and see somebody coming at you on right. final, right? Right. Um, yeah, we should all land into the wind, but we don't always do that either, right? So. You know that that's true. In fact, you know the 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 only thing that's uh, well about the only thing that's actually set in stone if you look at 91.126 that's the reg that says all turns shall be made to the left unless otherwise specified right. and you would know that by looking at the little rp below the airport diagram or the uh, segmented circle for example and a couple of examples here in the houston area would be hilltop lakes the restaurant just reopened up there at hilltop lakes a few months ago that's right hand traffic if you're landing to the south it's left hand traffic if you're landing to the north and the segmented circle tells you that if you go down to texas gulf coast regional um, you'll see an rp uh, below all the uh, the airport data block and it's a uh, right traffic to runway 17 which of course makes that left traffic to runway uh, th uh, 35 um, 
and but yet you'll still hear people talking about uh, uh, entering a left base for runway one seven. Oh, sure. And you just you know, and if if I hear that, I will gently correct them. It's right hand traffic down here because that's a busy, busy airport, and that's something you just can't let go. You don't want to get into an argument with them. That's that's another thing that 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 is a pet peeve at non towered fields is you'll get the you know the local. Uh, the local Gestapo, basically, that that decides that that he's going to cor- correct, or he or she is going to correct everything that's wrong, and they're going to do it on the radio in front of everybody, and that's not the way to do it. Yeah, this airport tower was closed for many hours of the day during the COVID stretch, oh, yeah. right? And there were a lot of there were a lot of uh, wannabe air traffic controllers working the radios, and and a lot of I guess, I would say discourse on which way were the winds blowing right you know on calm <laughs> days there was a lot of people landing d- different directions and three runways man that gets real hairy real quick right mm-hmm. so uh i did not fly much during those days around here when the tower was closed lots about entries there um i've seen a lot of departure mistakes as well i know we're talking about the pattern but i i think i think a student pilot that is is flying A long cross country probably doesn't know exactly what they're supposed to do. I'm a stickler on the 300 feet from pattern altitude before I turn. I think a low and slow turn is a scary thing for me. Obviously, it should be for any pilot. Yep. But uh, what about some departure thoughts? Maybe the bad that you've seen and maybe some best practices that you both would recommend to students and applicants out there. Well, as far as departing the traffic pattern, again, I, I, I keep going back to what does the book say? I mean, that's first of all, let's start with what, what the book says. And looking at AIM, again, chapter four, talks about at a non-towered field, uh, you fly straight out to 1,000 feet. This is departing the traffic pattern, sure. straight out to 1,000 feet, and then make a 45-degree turn in the direction of the traffic pattern in order to leave the traffic pattern. So a left-hand turn, 45 degrees off the runway heading at a non-towered field in a left-hand traffic pattern would be what you do. Same thing in a right-hand traffic pattern, 1,000 feet, 45-degree turn to the right. Um, if you're going straight out, AIM recommends just climb to 1,000 feet and just continue going straight out. So that's that's what the book says. There's no guidance that I have been able to find. Again, we were talking about this before we, the mics went hot. There's no guidance that I can find about how to exit the traffic pattern if you want to go the other direction. So the best I can suggest to my students and applicants when we get to the debrief portion of the check ride is go straight out. <clears throat> if you're left-hand traffic, go, go straight out and, and climb to 1,000 feet, continuing going straight out until you get to what you consider to be a safe distance from the airport and then make your right turn on course if that's the way you're going to do it. I've seen people that have turned crosswind um, and then turned downwind and then crossed the airport uh, to go in, in the opposite direction. In other words, make kind of a big sure. circle. And I, I, I don't have a, a real issue with that except that, that you really need to be cognizant of, of the fact that you may have someone entering the upwind side of the airport to fly a rectangular traffic pattern and then flying a crosswind downwind base and final. And what if that person happens to be crosswind about the time you turn across the airport? Mm. So, you know, there's a lot of what ifs and, 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 and probably highly unlikely things that can happen, but they can happen. And that's why we need to be thinking uh, in advance and listening for t- incoming traffic, hoping people are making proper radio calls. Cause that's another big deal is just making proper, accurate radio calls. Well, something that just jumped in my mind and it didn't earlier when we were discussing it, but maybe that fly fly, maybe that recommendation to fly to a thousand feet and then make a 45 left-hand turn is, because if something took off behind me faster, where should it be passing me? It should be passing me on the right. So mm-hmm. I, th- I can see where maybe I incorporate a 45 degree for another yeah. mile or two, just in case, half of a clearing turn, and then maybe come back. Yeah. That could be part of that recommendation. I'm just speculating, of course. And then, and then of course, you mentioned the 300 feet thing. Well, again, I go back to the back to the, the book. AIM says uh, remaining in the traffic pattern, turn crosswind within 300 feet of traffic pattern altitude. Within 300 feet of traffic pattern altitude. So, at an at an airport that's um, you know, let's see, at sea level, <clears throat> then 700 feet uh, would be the lowest. 
and the 1,000 feet, which is traffic pattern altitude, would be the highest. So within 300 feet of traffic pattern altitude is when you start your crosswind turn. One of the things that I see at our airport, and I suspect Wally sees it, it's Cleveland Airport, is when you're taking off and want to go the other direction, not in, in not remaining in the traffic pattern, and 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 wanting to go in the opposite direction from the from the direction of the traffic pattern, that uh, at somewhere around 500 feet above the ground or so, they'll start their right-hand turn out of the traffic pattern. And again, there's nothing that says you can't do that. It's not regulatory in nature, the AIM, or the, or the airplane flying handbook for that matter. But it's, it's certainly not good practice. Sure. What, yeah. do you think, what do you think, Wally? I, I I totally agree. Um, you know, again, we're just uh, as you said, the, the the aim is non-regulatory, and a lot of this that we're talking about is is um, techniques, if you will, best practices. But the bottom line is, we're trying to not to die, yeah, <laughs> not not to hit another airplane, right? So yeah, these these are all all excellent um, uh, excellent points. Yes, yeah, so let's talk a little bit of radio communication, something <laughs> that I know we've talked about. Um, is there any traffic in the pattern? I'll, I'll just start with that one. I guess. <laughs> Please advise. I know that's uh, everyone's favorite. You know, if, if, if anybody who I know well is listening to this podcast, they know what's coming next. Uh, that one is probably my number one pet peeve. Uh, any traffic in the area, please advise. First of all, again, going back to the book. If you look at AIM, chapter 4-1.9, uh, paragraph G to be specific, uh, it's, that is the only phrase that's specifically called out in AIM as improper phraseology and should never be used under any circumstances. It's the only one. Wow. Yet you hear it all the time. And it, it's a useless radio call because, first of all, if nobody answers, what do you know? Really, nothing that you didn't know already. If two or three or four people decide to be good Samaritans and answer all at once, what happens? You get a bunch of squealing radios in your ear. What do you know? Nothing more than you really knew next. And they're you know, all on the, top of each other. So you really all, don't hear any of them. Yeah, either. and you really don't know where they are at all. Right. So, so again, best practice, my recommendation is if there's an airport with a Unicom, um, West Houston, West Houston Unicom, Cessna one, two, three, four, five, six miles to the west end by landing. Do you have any reported traffic in the pattern? If you've got to ask that question, if you absolutely cannot help yourself, then try to talk to one person. Um, I was, I, I tell this story in my rusty pilot seminars and really almost any other chance I've got. So uh, probably some folks on the listening have heard this, but I was flying out of Brenham several years ago and with a student in the airplane and i heard this is the radio call i heard and i'm not making this up uh, it was uh, brenham traffic phenom one two three four five or ten miles north inbound the rnf one six uh, into brenham any traffic in the area known or unknown please advise okay. and and i and i boy i so wanted to key the mic and you know make some smart ass comment but I'm a professional. <laughs> I probably would have said something for sure. But, uh, you know, I'll, but one, one or, once or twice I've succumbed to the weakness. And, uh, and I'll key the mic and I'll just say, buy low, sell high. <laughs> <laughs> well, good tips. Good tips for sure. I, I, uh, think, I think making that comment, making that call, any traffic in the area, please advise. I, I think so, so if you don't hear anything... Um, I would guess people would get a false sense of security. Yeah. Well, oh, I, nobody's talking. So there's, it's I've good. shared this before on the show. I watched the Smithsonian channel, this air disaster show, which mm. makes no sense to a lot of people that I watch that show, but hopefully <laughs> I'm learning. But the most recent show I watched, there was a, it was a big King air of some sort passenger plane. And they kind of did that. Any traffic, it was an uncontrolled airport. And, Sadly enough, there was a citation waiting to go that was on the wrong radio channel, mm -hmm. and they were they were making their calls too, and there was some small single engine plane behind them that was going to go. Well, the, the 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 airline that was coming in was asking and asking, and they saw the bigger citation, and they asked, and the small single engine behind it answered for them. Yes. And unfortunately, the citation still took off, and they hit at the center, the midpoint of the field. Um, 
and it was a terrible disaster because I think everyone was everyone perished. But you know, you can't assume anything yeah. in these situations. And radio radio calls are, are scary enough if they're not being made or heard. And man, hopefully we're all on the right channel. That leads me to our conversation around what should we be saying when we're coming in? Should we should we just be saying November one two three four? 10 miles westbound in for a full stop inbound for a full stop. Uh, does that tell people enough about my aircraft and what, what I, what I'm intending to do? No, the, the aim is, is specific again, again, aim is non regulatory, but it's very specific about aircraft call signs. And it basically says that you should say the manufacturer name or the model name of the airplane. So Cessna 1234 X-ray uh, meets that requirement, but Skyhawk 1234 X-ray uh, meets this requirement even better, I believe. I, first of all, it, it um, tells people what what kind of airplane you're looking for. Um, sure, a Skyhawk and a Skylane and a 206 all look the same from three miles away. Um, it's a high wing Cessna, but um, if you are talking air traffic control, they know they now know the performance capability of the airplane. They know that a Skyhawk is about a hundred knot airplane. And uh, if if they if you're eight miles out and a Bonanza is eight miles out, they know they to put the Bonanza in front of you. But um, you know, just saying November one two three four X ray, it 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 says that the, you're a U.S. registered airplane or a U.S. registered aircraft. I should say it could be a helicopter. So um, uh, you you're supposed to say the airplane type. Yeah, and anything other significant value that would help other people. Um, Woodstock used to be very very bright, very different, right? So if if Pat was flying in, he could say yellow, yellow 152 or 150, but um, that would help me if I was in the pattern O so that I wasn't making the mistake of a, another high-wing aircraft that might have been white or blue uh, had I been in the pattern or wanting to stay in the pattern. Yeah, you're you're referring to the little yellow 152 that I used to yes. fly around. And yeah, oftentimes I would say yellow Cessna. Um, entering a left downwind, the yellow Cessna 103 uniform Charlie entering a left downwind or something along those lines because it was a bright yellow Cessna. Um, you, you, you and I have had, had a conversation too, uh, Wally, with regard to radio calls. That last call seems to be making its way around the country more and more and more and more. And I know you had some thoughts about that too. Yeah, yeah, that's that's another one that. Um uh, I'm not sure where a lot of this stuff comes from, um, but but that is something that is coming. I'm, I'm hearing a lot. Uh, another thing I, I hear a lot is, um, and I think people get this from watching TV, watching movies, I have eyes on the traffic. Mm-hmm. Um, I've got them know. on my scope, you mean? <laughs> no, well, I, yeah, yeah. They have yeah. that because they see yeah. them on their iPad. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and, you know, and, and I think, I think what we want is effective communication. And I think, a, an English speaking controller, uh, probably understands what you mean, but, uh, you know, you, you get to the point where, uh, if you start flying internationally, you're, you're speaking to controllers whose native language is not English and they may not know what you're talking about when you say things like mm-hmm. that. So, so try to stick to the standard phraseology. Got them on the fish finder. Doesn't doesn't qualify. Oh yeah, yeah. Got them on the fish finder. Or the metal detector. Got them yeah. on the metal detector. The other thing is the the mix in IFR traffic and VFR traffic. Um, you know, a lot of times we're doing uh, instrument approaches to uncontrolled airports. So um, you may have a couple people in the traffic pattern doing touch and goes, and and you call up and say, uh, we are over. Um, Jimbo intersection <laughs> inbound for landing. Mm-hmm. Well, the VFR tr- guy may not know where Jimbo intersection is. So, uh, just saying eight miles north of the airport inbound, uh, it, it gives a lot more information than saying I'm um, at such and such an intersection or or we're holding at at a fix uh, near the airport. Uh, just just say where you are. We're mm-hmm. we're six miles out, six miles north. Likewise, when I go to some other areas, they'll say. Uh, I'm I'm inbound just over the Christmas tree farm. Yeah, and and great. I don't I don't live around here. I don't know where your Christmas tree farm is, or yeah. that football field, or that high school. You know, local landmarks that are are known to the locals it doesn't help much to the pilots that are coming in from far away. 
No, that's right. Another thing that doesn't help very much is when someone announces that they're taking the active. And my first thought is, where are you taking it? I'm going to need it in a few minutes. <laughs> exactly. You know, how are you going to get it off the ground? Um, but the, if you if you look at at uh, Advisory Circular 90-66B, um, which talks a tremendous amount about uh, traffic patterns, traffic pattern etiquette, recommended radio communications, right of ways and the rights of way and things like that. Um, uh, if, if you look at that, um, it will give you some uh, some some really good guidance on um, the fact that there's there is no um, there's no active runway at a non-towered field. It's the runway in use. Right. In fact, the, the advisory circular will actually say that it's the runway in use. And let's let's talk about you know back in the day when New Braunfels and San Marcos were both non-towered fields. San, uh, Palacios down uh, to go, uh, the coast is a non-towered field. On any given day at any of those airports, any two runways could be in use because the wind split was split right down the middle. Mm-hmm. So if you're just if you're especially if you're operating at an airport with more than one strip of pavement, then saying taking the active doesn't say anything. It could be either one of those runways could be could be active. Um, better to say Cessna one two three four five is taking off runway one five. Uh, when you clear the runway, if you absolutely feel you have to make that radio call, which is not necessary, uh, I'm clear of runway 15 or something. So that somebody either taxiing out for takeoff or uh, just as importantly, somebody coming in from on course um, who's been listening to the radio understands that, okay, it is runway 15 that's in use, not the the other runway that sure. may be crossing it that could also be a possibility to, because the AWAS said it could be. Yeah, and you mentioned a couple names there. I think uh, the last point I'll make for today was I went to a non-controlled field in my training north of Houston, and my instructor said this. This we used to call this airport something else. It's got a new name, and you know the locals might still call it the old name, and, and you might be referencing something you're looking in a chart supplement or on a VFR map. Um, you you kind of got to be situationally aware of, yeah. of what those those people might be talking to about. Lots of one two one point nines out here, or one two two point nines out here. Or airports all over the south part of mm-hmm. of, te- of Texas. Yeah, very true. You got to be aware of of who's talking and who's who's in the pattern with you. Um, we 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 saw a plane coming the other direction at that field one time, and they were using the old name, and we were using the new name. Um, luckily, not no incident, but. You got to be aware of all these little intricacies of, of entering these patterns with a radio, maybe without a radio. Somebody might not have a radio. Lots of things that uh, could cause these incidents uh, in the traffic pattern for sure. Well, we talked about earlier, we talked about traffic pattern directions, right versus left. and But with regard to the change in names, we have a an example right here at a, of a non-tower field just 40, 50 miles south of where we're sitting right here, Texas Gulf Coast Regional a number of years ago was Brazoria County Airport. Mm. And then it got changed to Texas Gulf Coast Regional. And you still have folks that call, not so much now as a few years ago, but you still have folks calling up and calling it Brazoria County. Yeah. So, or Brazoria County as the, a- as the AWASH used to call it. So, yeah. yeah. So you got to be watching for that stuff. I think at the end of the day that, you know, just, you got to just keep your eyes out the window. We, um, Pat, I know you've flown out of a airport southwest of Houston where they have a pretty significant um, ag operation. And uh, those guys are usually not talking on the radio, and they're taking off in the direction that they're going, and they're landing in the direction that they're coming from, mm-hmm. irregardless of pretty much the, the wind doesn't really Any matter. Other rules? Yeah. So guidance. you may be in the pattern. Uh, yeah. Uh, there, there was a day I was down there doing a check ride, um, and we were in the traffic pattern and we were on final and, and my applicant said, there's an airplane about to land the other way. And I thought, okay, what do you want to do? And he said, well, we better go around. I thought, well, that's a great call. <laughs> and we did that. And as, um, I was actually flying an airline trip that same day and I was going into Las Vegas and had to do a go around in Las Vegas um, in a 737, I thought, wow, this is two real go-arounds in one day, two different airports, two different airplanes. I mean, 
Um, and and they, they were the real deal. They weren't just, hey, yeah. let's go around for the heck of going around. Yeah. Well, hopefully all of you learned a little something or have something to think about, maybe something new to read. Um, go check out those those textbooks that Pat referenced. Uh, get better with your traffic pattern etiquette at non-towered fields. As always, fly safe and stay behind the prop. Thanks for checking out the Behind the Prop podcast. Be sure to click subscribe and check us out online at BehindTheProp.com. Behind the Prop is recorded in Houston, Texas. Creator and host is Bobby Doss. Co-host is Wally Mulhern. The show is for entertainment purposes only and is not meant to replace actual flight instruction. Thanks for listening and remember, fly safe. Fly safe.